Look, the stuff about uh, finch beaks is certainly interesting. Let's, let's not um, uh, confuse ourselves about that. Um, the question is, can it be extrapolated? Or does it represent cyclic variation? Um, I can say, here's an account of how the eagle flies. Look, I get up, I jump in the air, I flap my hands a couple of times, and I land a few feet from where I started. Thus, the origin of flight. Uh, the obvious response is, this is nutty. You can flap your hands as, as long as you want. You won't fly like an eagle. Um, the argument from extrapolation can work in some circumstances. It fails in other circumstances. Plainly, in the case of a human being who jumps two feet in the air and then lands two feet from where he started, the argument from extrapolation fails. What persuades you in the case of the Galapagos finch that what seem to be cyclic variations are the start, the commencement of a grand uh, process of speciation? That's a step in the argument that has to be completed. It's not enough to say, well, it's more of the same. It's not more of the same self-evidently. It can easily be bounded variation of exactly the same sort as we see in any species experiment. Now, the contrary may be true. We may be seeing the development of entirely new species. The Galap Galapagos finch starts off as a finch, and uh, within 100 million years, there'll be a Galapagos elephant. Could be. But we need a whole lot more by way of evidence than a couple of uh, nutty journalists going down there looking at finch beaks and uh, writing a Pulitzer Prize winning book. A whole lot more of this is to be serious science. I mean, this doesn't even pass the threshold of anecdote. Uh, finch beaks change in size. Yeah, they do. They change in shape, too. It seems to be correlated with seasons. It seems to be a regress back toward the mean when the seasons change again. If this is the part of a spectacular evolutionary extrapolation, let's have additional reasons for thinking that. Otherwise, we're not even talking about a scientific hypothesis. The claim that there are no transitional sequences in the evolutionary record, or, 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 or nothing that looks like a transitional sequence, certainly is false. There are plenty of things that look like transitional sequences. And one of the interesting discoveries in the last 10, 15 years is the discovery of Ambulocetus natans, uh, which is a creature which um, seems to be midway between the terrestrial mammal, uh, from which the whales are said to derive, and some actual seagoing um, organism. It was found on land. It seems to be uh, something, something stubby with uh, things that look like they might develop fins uh, in due time. There's no question. This strengthens the idea of an evolutionary sequence, and it's pointless to deny it. However, the question has to be raised, as it should be raised whenever an evolutionary sequence is mentioned, what are exactly the predicted properties one would expect to find as one passes from a, a land-dwelling creature to a sea-dwelling creature. Specifically, how many changes are required to go from a creature such as Ambulocetus natans, which seemed to have been a, a land-dwelling creature, to, some, uh, to a creature that spends the entire portion of its life in the ocean? Uh, curiously enough, this is not a question that evolutionary biologists ask a whole lot. I did some uh, seat of the back of the envelope calculations myself, and the most modest estimate I could come up with is that um, an organism requires roughly 50,000 morphological changes to adapt itself to the open-going ocean. For example, a whale has about two tons of oil stuck up on its head so it can dive. It has a breathing spout on the top of its head. Ambulocetus natans doesn't. It has um, pectoral muscles that are specifically designed for navigation in the ocean. It has a, an enormously complicated feeding system. Whales are mammals, after all. Enormously complicated feeding system so it can pass milk to its young in the open ocean. Nothing else living in the ocean has anything like this. So the question is not whether this is an evolutionary sequence. Sure it is. It's very, very persuasive. Very interesting. The question is, what other part of the story isn't being told? And as soon as we introduce a quantitative estimate, however loose, however flabby, however spontaneous, then a great deal of puzzlement starts to uh, intrude into the otherwise sunny picture. 50,000 changes, and we've got two members of a sequence. Where are the other 49,999 members of that sequence if Darwinian changes are incremental and they're small? After all, we're not talking about changes that are arbitrary. A creature must have these changes if it's to survive in the open ocean. We've got uh, an evolutionary sequence that has six members. We need at least 50,000 more. They're not there. What does this suggest about the Darwinian scenario? Now, I don't know the answer to this question. I don't want to give you the wrong impression. I'm very impressed that 
just where a paleontologist said it would be, there was a creature that seems somehow uh, intermediary between a completely land-dwelling and a completely ocean-dwelling creature. That's an important bit of evidence. It's an important bit of evidence in favor of a Darwinian hypothesis. But it leads to the next step in the richness, the richening and development of a scientific theory. It leads to the first attempt to put a quantitative number on this. And any, any attempt to put a quantitative number should induce a profound sense of perplexity because the number of changes are so much greater than anything we see in the transitional record. Now, what is the proper explanation for this? Please understand, I don't have it, but neither do the other guys. Neither do the other guys, and uh, in my opinion, they refuse to recognize the legitimacy of the question. That is a fundamental question in paleontology. How many changes are required? Can those changes be compared to the fossil record? And if they are compared to the fossil record, why do we see such deficiencies in the record as compared to the necessary changes? Very important issues.